So today's presentation is the basics of corrosion and protections for ductile iron pipe presented by Brent Williamson. Brent Williamson has been with Canada Pipe for five years uh, and he specializes in education and presentations. So please welcome Brent. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, first of all, good morning. Um, and uh, I just wanted to thank the EOCP for this opportunity. This is our first time presenting here, so uh, I hope to make it a regular, uh, regular event. Um, my presentation is listed as um, the corrosion basics and protection of ductile iron pipe. Uh, what this is is actually a rare opportunity to um, see that the future of water delivery, which is kind of tying into their leading edge theme, and the future of water delivery is actually coming from the past here. And that's very rare that we get to see that in a real time thing here. So the combination of cast iron and new and improved ductile iron has been a major part of water delivery for over 350 years. Uh, ductile iron is safe, it's clean to produce, it's 100% recyclable, it's made with 98% recycled content, Pumping water through uh, ductile iron in some cases can reduce energy costs up to 40%. Ductile is stronger, more versatile than the leading competitor. So the question you're probably going to ask me is, well, why do we have other materials? Why is that? Well, the weakness of ductile iron and cast iron is a subject that I'm going to try to tackle today. And what I'm going to try to do is, is try to teach you more about what corrosion actually is and how it works. So corrosion um, uh, and pipeline protections are subjects that I'm very passionate about. So I'm excited to share this with you and uh, everybody watching. So I'm really happy that you're here. So the presentation you're about to see uh, is meant to challenge you. It's meant to make you think about corrosion and iron pipe. It's meant to surprise you. It's meant to make you think. It's give you a new perspective uh, on the concept of corrosion and iron pipe is something that gets talked about constantly in water infrastructure. Uh, corrosion and iron pipe are thought about in a couple of ways. They're thought of both simply and they're also thought of as very complicated. Um, and the simple thoughts are when you put iron pipe in the ground, it will break down. It'll break down and it'll go away. And the complicated thoughts on it are how do we protect it? So corrosion protection is often thought about as very, very complicated and I'm going to try and break that all down for you and stop that from happening. So um, with this presentation, I intend to clear up these myths and facts with some science, uh, some real world examples. Um, the general ideas about corrosion and its effects on iron pipe get filtered and talked about through so many different things and people that it ends up being like that game when you were a kid. Remember that game when you were a kid and you played telephone and you talk to the person beside you and they said something and then the next person said something and by the time it got to the end everybody laughed because it was nowhere near what the truth was. That's kind of what happens with iron pipe. So I'm going to try to uh, change that. So here it is to start with. So this is what we started with. So this is the man that started cast iron pipe and uh, this is Louis the 14th. He was probably the most powerful monarch in the world at the time. France was the leading edge of science, the leading edge of technology, the leading edge of art during that time. So this is what he did. He put this iron pipe in uh, the Palace of Versailles uh, to pump his fountain. And that pipe stayed there until the 1960s, working, OK? There's a copy of it. There's a piece of it that we actually have at the McWayne facility um, in Birmingham, Alabama. That's a piece. The M on it says for Marseille, because that's where it was uh, cast in, Mar in Marseille. This is the difference that we're looking at. So now we're on ductile iron, okay? This is gray iron, you can see on the left there. And this is ductile iron. So gray iron is 45,000 uh, PSI tensile strength, 21,000 yield, and there's no elongation. It is a brittle pipe, okay? It's strong, but it is a brittle pipe. Ductile iron, on the other hand, is 60,000 PSI tensile strength, 42,000 PSI yield, and a 10% elongation, which means that this is a flexible pipe. This is what it is. Okay, so when we are making DI pipe, now we don't mine, we don't mine for iron ore, we don't do any of that stuff. All of it is fancy recycling, basically. And how do we get all the material that we do to make all the pipe? Well, we recycle cars mostly, and train cars, and old metal. We recycle, McWayne alone, and Canada Pipe McWayne alone will recycle about 800,000 cars a year. So that's a car and a half a minute every day, including Christmas and New Year's. So what it is, it's fancy recycling. 
this is the process. Every single thing here that we are doing to make ductile iron pipe, we are adding energy. We're adding energy into iron pipe, or old material to make iron pipe. So this is one of the themes here. One of the themes, where we already got to a couple of them, the themes are comp simple and complicated. And the other theme here that you have to realize when you're talking about iron pipe and corrosion is that we are adding energy. And what does that mean when we're talking about corrosion? We're going to get to that. So I'm going to try and answer corrosion. What is corrosion with a question to you? And I know it's rhetorical because you can't answer, but why do we cement line pipe? Why do we cement line? Now, some of you are probably thinking, what do you mean cement line? I've never heard of that before. What are you talking about? Every piece of pipe that comes out of um, uh, any facility, whether it's McWayne, American Cast Iron, U.S. Pipe, anybody, they will cement line that pipe. They will cement line it. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Well, we're creating a physical barrier. We're creating a physical barrier between the water and the iron to prevent this. We're trying to prevent internal corrosion or tuberculation, okay? This is something that is something in the past. This doesn't happen anymore. It hasn't happened since the 1920s, since we started putting cement line in. So now 100 years now that we've been cement lining pipe. So keep that in mind. And this is a physical barrier. So keep that in mind when we're talking about corrosion for external problems. This is what it looks like when we're putting it in. It's a very thin layer of cement mortar lining. And that is a physical barrier that is stopping uh, the water from touching the iron. Here's what it looks like with a seal coat, so it's nice and black. And that's what it looks like without a seal coat, so optional. Okay, how do we know what we know? Okay, so what, when I'm talking to you, how do you know what I'm, the information I'm bringing to you is real, is, is current? Um, well, we get it from these places. We get it from the National Association of Corrosion Engineers. We get it from the Steel Structures Painting Council, American Petroleum Institute. It goes on and on. I don't have to read them all for you, but that's where we get all our information from. We also get them from a company called DIPRA, which is the Ductile Iron Pipe Research Association, and they are paid by all of us. They're paid by um, the uh, U.S. Pipe, they're paid by American Cast Iron, and they're paid by McWayne, which is the three North American um, manufacturers. What is corrosion by definition? Corrosion by definition is deteriorated by the environment. Remember when I talked about themes? This is the simple theme. The simple theme is, hey, that is iron pipe. It gets corroded. It gets corroded by the environment. This is the Dipper test sites, one of the ones in California. You can see all the pipe on the ground there. That's what they do. They'll wrap it. They'll put different things on it to try and they'll put it in bare, uncoated, coated, whatever they have to do to see what the, what the data is. And this is the data from non-aggressive soils. How do we know this? Well, this is actually a scientific fact. The scientific fact that it'll last 300 years or more because we have that fact in non-aggressive soils in Versailles, France. It's over 350 years that it's been in the ground. So we know that it'll last. But let's focus on the types of corrosion that, that affect iron pipe, okay? There's two. There's two types of corrosion that affect iron pipe. Microbial corrosion, which is a type of corrosion that's called biocorrosion. It's basically like oxidation, okay? It's not rust. Oxygen must be present for oxidation to occur. That's why it's called oxidation. Galvanic corrosion is the other one. This is the one that's called a bimetallic corrosion. It's where one corrode, metal corrodes preferentially as opposed to another, okay? And it has to be in the presence of an electrolyte. An electrical connection must be presence, present for the corrosion to occur. So remember what we talked about themes. I'm going to keep talking about it because it's very important to drill into anybody that's listening. The themes, corrosion is always thought about as being simple. Well, it's actually complicated how it works. And the protection that you're about to see, well, that you're going to see, is a lot more simple. Okay? So is this corrosion? No. I love answering my own questions. Um, but no, this is not corrosion. This is oxidation. She was not green when she came from France. She was uh, bright and shiny copper. And what happened to the metal uh, across this very, very thin piece, uh, sheet of copper that's covering a steel girder? Why isn't that steel gone? Why isn't that steel gone and corroded gone? Well, because it's being protected by the copper on the top. Okay, the copper basically patinaed and it turned green and it protected the rest of the metal, the steel girder. So it's not corrosion. This is basically oxidation. What about this? Let's take a closer look. Does it look like rust? Well, it's not. It's oxidation. That is Corten steel. And they actually do put that, they build those bridges on purpose like that. They actually build street signs with it too. 
because what the metal does is it protects itself. When it oxidizes, it actually protects itself. That is a form of quote unquote corrosion, but it's not corrosion that actually hurts anything. This is oxidation, okay? What about this? This is actually from locally, from Vancouver here. This is the pipe that the city of Vancouver puts in the ground. Some people will be like, oh, it's rusting. Well, that's not rusting either. That's oxidation too. So what is that happening? Well, that's the, the air reacting with uh, water that was on the pipe and it oxidizes. That's what it is, reacts with the, with the, iron, with the iron oxides. This is not corrosion either. This is a discoloration because we painted half of it with uh, the uh, asphaltic coating and we left the ha other half off and that's what it looks like. There's some corrosion. That's what corrosion looks like. And what we're gonna try to teach you here, or what I'm gonna try to teach you here is that you see how the little spots, why did it corrode in those places and not other places? You can see that there's some places on the pipe that aren't corroded at all and some places that are. Why does it do that? How does it work? And how do we stop it properly? There's another example. It follows a path and you're gonna see what that path is and how that path works, okay? So let's focus on galvanic corrosion. Galvanic corrosion is an electrochemical process. Sounds pretty complicated, right? It is complicated. It's more complicated than it is simple. These are the galvanic rankings of metal that we, that we have, okay? So magnesium and zinc and aluminum, all those things are, they're, they're on the top of them. They're less noble. They will corrode first. Gold, platinum, they will not corrode. They won't corrode ever. They're, they're more noble. Okay, these are the potentials in pipe soil, okay? And what we're looking at when we see this is that you're seeing millivolts, okay? And you're seeing a minus sign in that. That's the energy that's being taken out of the pipe. Okay, that's taking out, we're taking energy. Remember when we made that pipe, we put energy in, well now we're taking energy out. That's how corrosion works. So this is what it is. This is anodic and cathodic, and this is where ductile lands, okay? The ductile lands in the minus 525 millivolt range. And how small that is, this little tiny battery is three volts. We're talking about minimal, minimal amounts of electricity to, to, to make this process work, okay? These are the ingredients we need. We need four things for corrosion to happen. It is not as simple as an iron pipe in the ground. You need the chemistry of the, me of the, of the metal, first of all. You need the chemistry of the soil, and you need the electrolyte. You need all these things to happen. You need a cathode, you need an anode, you need the electrolyte, which is the soil, and you need the pipe. You need the pipe because the pipe is the return current path. That is what's making all these things go around in a big circle, okay? So what if I somehow did this? What if I, what if I blocked that, uh, what if I blocked that pipe? What if the soil didn't know that the pipe was there? Would there be corrosion? Let's put it a different way. Who likes football? I like football. So we need these things for a game to happen, do we not? We need to have the anode, which is the losing team. Sorry to all the Jets fans, but they lose a lot. Um, we need the winning team, which is the cathode. We need a ball, which is the electrolyte. And we need, we need a way for them to communicate. We need a path for them to move on. We need the field. So what happens if I say, well, I'm taking away the field? Field's gone, they're playing on air. There's nothing, there's no ground, there's nothing. Can they play a football game? The answer is no, that doesn't work. You only have to take away one thing to stop corrosion. And you only have to take away one thing here to stop a football game. A lot of times when you see this picture, you're thinking, this is what people talk to me about, and they say, well, this is how corrosion works. You're seeing the ground attacking that pipe, and that's, that's really not what's happening. Okay? It's not a big electrical shock that's hitting that pipe. It's not that. What happens is, we, we call it, some call it decycling, we call it de-energizing the pipe. It is literally taking energy out of the pipe and moving on. That's what's doing, okay? This is an example of what it is. It pulls energy out. So you can see the spot on that pipe that's corrosion. Here's another picture of it. And that's where that current that was running down the pipe and running down the electrolyte, that's where it jumped out. That's where it jumped out and went to a lower voltage. Like you see all those things, milliamps. Remember the milliamps? They're smaller. The smaller the number, the more that it's jumping out. Okay? So it went, to a, it went to a smaller millivolt. It jumped out of that pipe and it took all the energy with it, which is what made that hole. This is, a, this is a really good picture. It's called graphitization. So you can still see on the very, very top of this pipe here, you can see that the seal coat is still attached, but 
it's starting to crumble like a, like a like an apple crumble, right? And what it's doing is it's breaking down that iron and it's taking the iron oxides with it and taking that energy out, but it hasn't gone all the way down, all the way through the through the iron to to make a hole. So once it gets down to that and the pressure can't be held anymore, that's when you get a leak. These are the types of protection that we look at when we're talking about iron pipe. So cathodic protection is a big one, zinc coating, polyethylene encasement, which I'm going to talk a lot about, bonded coatings, and denso tape. Those are the ones. There's other ones that you can use, but these are the ones that the water industry looks at a lot. So we're going to look at a couple of them right now, okay? Let's look at a couple. So this is cathodic protection. This is how cathodic protection works. So what you're doing is you're having a sacrificial anode. You're taking, you're, you're redirecting that current to somewhere else to corrode something else. You're making the pipe the cathode. You're making the pipe the winner. Okay, so it's going to corrode something else instead. So there's other ways to do it. There's also called impressed current cathodic protection. And impressed current cathodic protection, that's like the Cadillac of protection. Or if you're in Europe, that's like the Ferrari of protection. You, you can't... You can't break it down. It, it will always protect the pipe because it's monitored. Okay, so what this is what it looks like. This is a better picture of it. So this is the electrolyte, the, the reference electrode, the impressed current, and it's attached to a monitoring system basically, and that's how it knows what it is. I'll give you a better uh, view of it here. So that purple rope that you're seeing in the picture, that's the anode. Okay, that's what we're looking at. But let's 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 bring our let's bring our electrolytes and our le let's bring our electric current into the into the equation here. So here it is. These are a little different. The chemistry of the metal has different voltages all over the pipe. That's what the chemistry is doing. So you're seeing that it's going down the 600 millivolt. It's going to the 540. The 540 is going to the 490. The 530 is going to the 490. But there's a spot. There's a gap here. There's a gap between the 620 and the 530. That's where corrosion will happen. That's where that current will jump off and go somewhere else. And then it'll take that energy and that pipe with it. So what do we do with cathodic protection? Well. We redirect it. We take that current and redirect it. What do we do with impressed current cathodic protection? Well, we do this. We take that anode and we bathe that pipe in a waterfall of current. So everything is the same voltage. Everything now is 900 millivolts as opposed to lower. So now that, that pipe on the ground there, that pipe is now the winner. That pipe will always be the winner. What's the problem with this? What's the problem? with cathodic, this seems like a perfect solution. Well, what's the problem with this? The problem with this is that it has to be monitored, and this pipe now will have to be chained. That, that impressed current will have to be changed three times in the pipe's lifespan. There's got to be a better way. We're going to try and get to other stuff here. Some say that zinc is the answer. This is very popular in Europe. Zinc, them say zinc is the answer. McWayne and the other um, manufacturers in North America don't feel the same way. Here's uh, from them. It says, although uh, zinc is an enhancement to protecting McWayne ductile iron pipe from corrosion, it does not provide a standalone protection. So basically what we're saying is you're buying uh, insurance on top of your insurance. It still requires something else. This is a belief that's shared by others. This was at an ACE conference a couple of years ago. This was done by another company. It says with soils with a pH value of 4.5 or greater, um, DC straight currents, extremely corrosive soils, um, they still require polyethylene encasement along with the zinc, okay? So, but I've got a better way. Like I said, the better way is polywrap. Polywrap is, if it ain't marked, first of all, it ain't real. It's got a 3,600 PSI tensile strength. It is very strong. Uh, it's very durable, which you'll see in a sec. So what's the history of this? Well, the history of it is that it was researched in 1952, it was used in 1958, and it became a standard in 72. So we've been using it for a long time. We know a lot of data on it, um, and I'm going to show you a couple. But I wanted to give you a real-world example, a real thing that happened. Okay, this is, uh, this is 25 years that this, this pipe was buried in Cape Cod in the mud, in, right by the water. This is the most, one of the, some of the most corrosive environments you can get to if it's right by an ocean water. Okay, this, so this is very corrosive. So this is what it did after 25 years. That pipe is gone. Um, 25 years and it's gone. Okay, but this is the pipe, same pipeline, 100 feet away, because it was wrapped in poly. We blocked that return current path, remember. We took the pipe out of the equation. The soil does not know it's there. So what happened here? Well, what happened here we found out is that the contractor ran out of poly wrap and decided that I'm not gonna buy another roll for 100 feet. 
So that's what happened. And we're digging discs. That that's not just water that you're seeing either. That's the ocean. Okay, so remember that that's the ocean. And the, the stencil paint is still on the pipe. It's brand new pipe. That's 100 feet down from that disaster that they had. So that's real world. This is another real world example. This is the first ever poly wrapped pipe in North America. And this is actually in the most corrosive soil in North America. If you think your community has corrosive soil, you should talk to these guys. This is in Lafouche, Paris, Louisiana. And if you were to step in that soil, you can see a footprint in the soil. If you were to step in that soil with your rubber soled shoes and stood in there for an hour, your rubber soled shoes would be gone. That's how corrosive this soil is. So we put this pipe in, this is a four inch cast iron pipe, and we wrapped it with the poly that you can see. This is what it looked like. There's, we take it out every 13 years now. So this is what you can see. You can see that it's wrapped, then we unwrap it, and then we take a metal brush and brush it down and there you go. Perfectly, perfectly good pipe. Okay, and that's been in there since 1958. So I think we're proving what, what we can do. This is locally. This is the city of Port Moody here. Um, and uh, this is um, the, uh, the, what they do here. They, they wrap it ahead of time and then they put it in. And a lot of guys ask me, this is the video, I hope it plays here, so, but this is the, why won't it rip? Well, a lot of guys will ask me, won't it rip? Or um, how durable is it when it gets in the soil? Well, this is how durable it is. Just dumping it on there. And the answer is it's very durable. It is eight millimeter thick. It is extremely uh, rip proof. If it is ripped, there is a very, very easy way to fix it. Okay, this is our test data from Dipper on Corrosive soils. I showed you one that was on non-corrosive soils. Now I'm going to show you one that's on corrosive soils. So we know uh, from our testing, and we do all the testing, um, is that we know that a sandblasted you know, corrosive soil and kneeling oxide layer, that pipe is probably gone in about a decade. That's how fast that that process will happen. If it's bare, maybe a little more. If it's manufactured shop, maybe 24 to 25 years, like you saw in the Cape Cod mud there. And if it's polyethylene encased, 500 years, more. This is why we're on the leading edge and why this is important for something like the EOCP because we are on the leading edge of environmental. This is the environmental aspect of this pipe. If you can take this pipe, a recycled content pipe, put it in the ground, protect it easily, you're doing pretty well. This is what we do for a design decision model on how we determine what needs it, okay? And this is what we look at. This is the old school model and you could see if it was a 10 point scale, 10 point scale, if it had 10 points, you wrap it, that was it. But now we're looking at things a little differently. We're looking at the new design decision model and it's better together is what I'm saying here. This is what it looks like. We have a two dimensional matrix for it. What we have now is we have a likelihood and we have a consequence. What does that mean? Well, let's talk about it. This is what it looks like, by the way, the two dimensional matrix. But what does it mean? So the likelihood and the consequences. The likelihood is the soil. The likelihood is the resistivity, the pH, the redox, all those scientific values that will determine if a soil is corrosive or not. The consequences are different. The consequences are what's the pipe size? Is it a large pipe? What's the pipe location? Is it down the middle of a residential area? What is the depth of cover? Cover Is there an alternative water supply? Should we be putting extra insurance on this pipe? That's what we talk about when we talk about likelihood and consequences. And you can see from the two-dimensional matrix, if you ever want to see it, I can send it to anybody. Um, but uh, you can see it that the likelihood and the consequences very rarely will ask for cathodic protection on some of those products. Polywrap will take care of pretty much everything. So these are the baggy bonuses, and I'm not going to read them all to you, but the one I want you to see is the bottom one. The bottom one is no maintenance. It's really important, guys, because no maintenance means that I don't have to go in there every three times of that pipe's lifespan to, to, to replace the anode now. You, once you wrap it, it's done. You wrap it and it's finished for its life. The new improved version of PolyWrap is actually called V-Bio and it's a volatile and corrosion inhibitor. What this is now stopping is what we learned at the beginning of the presentation. Now it's stopping microbial corrosion as well. It's stopping 
that small amount of corrosion at the beginning, and it's stopping now the cathodic or the uh, the other corrosion as well, the uh, um, the dangerous one. So V bio polyethylene encasement, it's a low uh, layer density polyethylene. It's co extruded. It's a food grade biocide in it. That's what stops that. Um, that microbial corrosion. And what is that biocide, you're probably asking? Well, if you brush your teeth every morning, it's the same stuff that's in your toothpaste. That's what it is. And it complies with AWWA as well. So how do we have scientific data for what it does? And a lot of guys, they like seeing the evidence, the real world stuff, but a lot of people are more of a science-based thing. So I put a science-based uh, evidence in here for you. These are uh, electro, uh, electrolyte probes that are put under poly wrap. And this is what happens on a regular poly wrap. So what you can see here is all those little bumps, that's basically oxygen that's being eaten away and burned away by the microbial corrosion. That's what happens under the poly wrap. But once the oxygen is gone, there's no more corrosion because oxygen is depleted and it's gone. What happens under V-Bio? Nothing. Nothing happens. And I actually had somebody tell me, it was a corrosion uh, tech who studies corrosion in the field, and, and he says, well, I don't like that V-Bio stuff that, that, that's being put on pipe now. And I said, well, how come you don't like it, sir? And he said to me, well, I don't like it because I don't get any readings on it. Well, that's the point. We don't want readings on it. We want nothing to happen, which is what happens here. So what are the benefits? Why, what, we talked about it at the beginning of the presentation, but a lot of people will say, well, why should we bother using ductile iron pipe if we have to protect it, if we have to make sure it's protected? Well, there's a lot of reasons. We do everything. High pressure, shallow bury, deep bury, seismic areas, contaminated soil, can, it's impermeable to hydrocarbons, uh, river crossing pipes, trenchless applications. We can do HDD with uh, ductile iron. Bridge crossings, it's 13 times stronger than PVC. So that's why we can use it and protect it. And it's environmentally friendly. Everything is iron in the waterworks industry. This, you can't hide from it. Nothing is immune to it. PVC and corrosion, well, this is a not example. A lot of times you go, and I have talked, I'll talk to you about a community that I dealt with. This is what we look at. We look at this. Corrosion doesn't know the difference. Corrosion doesn't know the difference between a pipe and a fitting. It will attack all of it. It'll attack the bolts first because they're made out of a more noble or a less noble metal. It'll attack the fittings. Eventually, it'll start breaking down, and I have proof of it. Here's an example. Pipe looks great. The fittings, on the other hand, weren't. I'm not going to name the community, but the community on this one, I actually asked them. I said, what was your corrosion plan? And they said, our corrosion plan, we were using PVC pipe, and, and there was your example of what happens here. So let's keep in mind. And I want to thank everybody. That's my time. Um, I hope that it entertained you. I hope that you learned something. This is all my contact information. If you need anything, um, please uh, let me know. If you want to see this presentation for anybody else, your cities, your municipalities, uh, consulting engineers, I'm more than, uh, more than happy to do it for you. And uh, again, let me thank the EOCP for inviting. I really hope we can make it a regular thing. So thanks, guys, very much. All right. Thank you very oh. much, Brent. Uh, oh. We're going to have to call you back for oh, okay. questions. questions, right? Excellent. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, okay, so let's jump into the questions here. Um, at what point do you decide to replace a rusting pipe? Well, it depends on what, first of all, uh, ductile iron doesn't rust. That's the first uh, false, uh, false statement in there. Uh, ductile iron doesn't rust. Ductile iron and cast iron, they, they will corrode, they won't rust. It's a different thing. Oxidation is, 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 is that. But what, when you're talking about that is, is if you're in a situation where you're knowing that your cast iron is starting to break down, well, you'll know it'll be a leak. If it's not leaking, um, then it could be just oxidation that's on there, that brown layer, which happens to all pipe. Uh, it happens to all pipe, happens to all fittings. Um, you can wrap that. Um, you, when you need to replace it is when you have a leak, is basically when you need to replace it. All right, thank you. Um, another question here. Why wouldn't you wrap all the pipe from the factory in poly? Why wouldn't you do it first? 
Uh, because when you're, it depends on what the contractor, we leave it for the contractor to do. Uh, it's actually a lot easier for them to do it than it would be for us to do it. Plus it can get damaged in shipping. We don't want that. We want that them to be able to wrap uh, the pipe. We want them to be able to wrap the fittings. Um, you can cut the poly in half and wrap it around and tape it around fittings. You can tape it around valves. You can tape it around everything. So we don't really need to wrap it at the factory. Uh, it would be, and it depends on the soil too. It's not all soil is corrosive as I've tried to prove in the presentation. So um, you may not need it. Um, so we will leave it for the engineer and the contractor to put on. Hope that answers that. Okay. Um, how do you how do you seal the poly wrap after wrapping it around the pipe? It's just wrapped in tape. It's not sealed. It's not watertight. If that's the question, the question if you don't it, we don't need to seal it. We need to have that flow through it. Uh, water does not cause corrosion. Uh, water is only a two points on the scale uh, to a ten point scale, and when you get to ten points, uh, that's when you have corrosion. But water only accounts for two points of it. Water can't corrode pipe. That's why you'll see sunken ships in the ocean that have been there for 100 years and they're still not gone yet. Um, and it's the same thing with soil. You could have running water past it, it you just tape it. Tape it with, uh, with the poly tape that comes with it and that's basically it, it's, it's on. As long as there's no contact between the soil and the pipe, we're good. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you determine the soil before installing new pipe? Uh, well, there's lots of uh, geotechnical engineers that will do uh, soil testing. Uh, they'll be, uh, soil testing has been a part of communities for years. Um, I'll give you an example of what's not happening anymore. The city of Vancouver, where we are right now, um, they use ductile pipe exclusively, uh, and they just don't bother with soil testing anymore. They will just wrap everything because the wrap is so inexpensive. So um, they'll just do that. Uh, but if you need a soil testing, there's places that will do soil testing for you. Geotechnical engineers will have uh, probes, corrosion probes that will, they'll put into the ground. They'll test the soil and they'll tell you this is how much resistivity in it. This is how many ohms it is. This is how much the redox is. And then it'll tell you this is how corrosive it is. And then you can determine what kind of protection you want from there. Okay, I think uh, one more question. Um, it says here, it's one thing to backfill on a pipe with an excavator, but how does poly wrap, poly wrap stand up to shovels, and how do you repair rips? Well, first of all, it's it's extremely durable, even with shovels. If you're throwing, if you're digging around it or what have you, that that's not going to be a big deal either. Uh, I see that in the field all the time. And how you prevent rips? You, if it's a small rip. Um, First of all, if it's a small rib, it depends how big that rip is. So if we're talking about pinholes, and if they punched a hole in a little little bit, then that's not going to cause corrosion because what do we need? What have we learned already? What do we need for corrosion to occur? We need oxygen, um, and that's not enough oxygen. It, we're talking a baseball-sized hole. We're talking about like a large hole. And what you do with that? Well, you just cut a piece of poly, put it over top, tape it. I mean, this. what the themes of the presentation were, Corrosion is not as simple as you think it is, and protection is not as complicated as you think it is. So. Yeah, I think we'll squeeze one more in there. Um, <laughs> are, are all ductile, ductile iron pipes bell and spigot? Can it be welded? No, you wouldn't weld ductile iron pipe. That would be for the steel guys. They would weld that, and that's more for um, oil and gas industries. And the oil and gas industries will use cathodic protection no matter what, because if you have a leak in an oil and gas uh, main, you have pe environmental damage or you have people dying. Um, so that's why they will use that specifically. But you can't weld uh, that. You can do um, different joints. Ductile iron has different joints. Ductile iron has flange joints, mechanical joints, uh, push-on joints. Uh, we even have restraint joints now that are used without using external restraints. They're called TR Flex. Um, we have seismic joints now, um, so we don't really need to weld them. We even have river crossing pipe now that can do, you know, 15 degrees of uh, deflection. Um, so there's lots of options there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sorry, um, I stepped out. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, on behalf of the EOCP, I'd like to thank you for your presentation today. I, uh, I thought it was great. Awesome. Um, and I learned some great information. So. 
um, we do have a little gift for you. Awesome. Um, and yeah, like I said, thank you so much for that presentation. Well, thank you. Appreciate it.